Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the wateroperator.org uh, webinar on essential resources for primacy agency staff. My name is Steve Wilson. I'm um, managewateroperator.org, and I have with me uh, Katie Buckley from our staff, as well as Hideyuki Terashima. Um, this webinar is co-sponsored by ASDWA, the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. I want to say thank you to them um, for both agreeing to um, be here today to answer questions as well as uh, co-sponsoring our event and advertising that for us. And so um, we're going to get right to it. Um, a little housekeeping. Um, this webinar isn't approved for pre-approved for continuing education credit, but what we can offer is a certificate. Um, if you just have to email us and ask for that after you've uh, after the webinar is over. And uh, we're also willing to work with you to complete any forms you need for your certification body, including um, a copy of the slide deck or you know, every state has a little bit different rules on what they provide or allow. And I realize some states these have to be pre-approved and uh, you know, that's just not something we have the bandwidth to do. Um, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available on our YouTube channel um, after the fact as well as on our event page. And I think I show a slide of that here at some point. Um, along with the other webinars we've done this year on different sets of uh, resources that are available through our site. Um, one thing I want to point out is um, there will be time for questions at the end. And so if there's anything that comes up today um, that you have a question about, please put it in the question box. Katie's monitoring that and we're sharing a Google Doc. Um, and at the end, I'll just pull that document up and we can go through those questions. And I'll just tell you, if, if I can answer it, I will, or if, I'm, if one of the Azure folks can, um, in all likelihood. But if we can't, we'll find the answer and get back to you. So um, I think that's really um, all there is there. Today, we're going to talk about what wateroperator.org is, as well as um, how it can support you. And again, this presentation is geared towards primacy agency staff, but I realize there's a lot of other folks on the line as well as you know, um, operators or those that run water systems. And that's great because it's uh, useful stuff for you as well. Um, we did an RTCR, uh, or Hideyuki did um, back at the end. I said April here, but it's on March 30th, I think. And so I'm gonna use a few of those slides as examples of um, some of the resources we have and uh, how to kind of go back and, and find those based on uh, what was in that webinar. And again, those are also available as videos to watch. And then some additional resources that we um, want to make sure you're aware of. Um, and then at the end, we'll get to our questions. So um, a little bit about us. So the state water survey is unique in the country. Um, I think Oklahoma has a state water survey now, but Illinois is the only state with uh, until uh, then um, that has had a state water survey. It's a sister agency to our state geological survey and natural history survey. Um, we've been a state agency um, since 1895, so this is our 125th anniversary. Um, in 2008, we were moved into the U of I um, under PRI, which stands for Prairie Research Institute. And uh, so now we're U of I employees instead of state employees, but we still have a state mandate. We still collect the state's well logs. Um, we have uh, under the Water Use Act in Illinois, we're required to collect high capacity water use information from anyone that pumps over 100,000 gallons a day. And uh, we also run um, a lot of monitoring networks. We do a lot of uh, research related to groundwater and surface water and atmospheric sciences. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a water-based applied research institution that also does public service is I guess the best way to say it. So um, our funding comes from, which I forgot to mention, uh, for wateroperator.org comes from RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, uh, through a grant from US EPA. And so we're fortunate we've been um, a part of um, EPA programs since around uh, a little before 2000 when um, the technical assistance centers were uh, in, uh, existed uh, from, I think, 1998, maybe to about 2009. And we were part of the Midwest Technology Assistance Center. And so um, the water survey really started as a public health organization. And uh, we were created um, really to help communities in Illinois that were struggling um, at that time with uh, cholera and typhoid outbreaks. And um, this is, you know, when uh, chlorination wasn't a given and a lot of communities still didn't have uh, water systems that did any kind of treatment. And uh, as an example of that, in our files, uh, we have files for every community in Illinois 
And this is from 1916. It's a typhoid outbreak in Pena, Illinois. So the water survey was sent in to determine what the situation was and what was causing the typhoid problems. Um, everyone assumed it was either their water or their wastewater systems. Only half the town was sewered. They didn't build, uh, they started building a wastewater treatment facility in 1915. It wasn't done. Um, they built a water treatment plant in 1912, but the mayor, uh, it never got finished because the mayor wouldn't spend the money. Uh, that still sounds familiar today sometimes. And so um, in the end, after investigating these outbreaks, it was determined that it was a Pena Ice Cream Company, which also sold milk. And so um, as the story goes here, uh, when this problem was solved, um, there's one large tank where seven different dairy farmers brought their milk and put it into one tank. And everyone in town uh, used a bucket to get their milk out of that tank. And uh, so that's where the typhoid came from. And that was quickly solved um, after that. 35 cases though, um, and I think only one person died. But it's just um, the example I use because it really talks to our history. And uh, you know, a lot of folks, especially outside of Illinois, uh, have never heard of the State Water Survey. We've been around a long time and um, do a lot of good work uh, and research. So getting to wateroperator.org, um, you know, it's really a clearinghouse of information and also a national calendar. And the advantage there, you know, our funding comes through the small systems programs at EPA. Um, we're here to help small systems and those who, um, you know, need that support. And if you have, you know, a lot of small systems don't have time to search online, they may only go to one training a year that's, um, you know, either an association uh, three-day event to get their CEUs and not even realize there's other opportunities. Um, and so what we've done is we put all of the trainers in every state all in one calendar and made that searchable. So the, it, we list over 13,000 events a year. And I'll, I'll go through that quickly today just to give you an idea of what kind of resources might be available uh, in that respect, as well as we've uh, added over 15,000 documents uh, into our database, not the actual documents, but links to them. So as a primacy agency, you may have uh, information and resources on your website. We likely link to them. Um, but the advantage is an operator searching for something on a given topic can find things from 15 different state uh, primacy agencies at once and not have to go do all that searching themselves. Um, we did a survey of operators in Illinois in 2006 and found that for systems under 500 connections, the average operator only spent 25% of his time as a water operator and a good portion of those folks had full-time jobs outside of their water system. And so um, it's about this site is really about providing an easy, quick way for them to get the information they need. And they can also lean on us. We um, provide, uh, we have a phone number and an email address and folks can call us or email us and ask for help. And we'll either get them in touch with a TA provider or find the resource they're looking for um, and provide it to them all for free. Uh, again, because this is funded through RCAP and US EPA. Um, we vet information from nearly 800 organizations. So those are trainers, state agencies, associations, uh, federal agencies, uh, anyone who's dealing with water or wastewater uh, issues in the US. And uh, again, um, I mentioned RCAP and EPA, and so that's kind of the gist of what we provide. So um, it's really a clearinghouse, as I mentioned. We've also done a lot of legwork and put value-added information into uh, our database so that when you're searching for things, um, you can get a good idea of what it is without downloading it, spending the time going through it yourself. So we've created a summary for each of those things. We've also created a nested search um, so that you can take, um, if your initial search shows there's 400 documents, uh, obviously no one can go through all 400 or wants to. And so there's a way to narrow that down to the specific topic or type of document you're looking for. And I mentioned you can call us or email us, and that goes not only for operators, but for anyone who's looking for help finding resources. Um, our program staff are really good at using the internet. And if there's something we don't have, um, if it's available for free, we'll find it. Um, so anyway, yeah. And yeah, okay. So today the goal is really to show you how um, our site works, what kind of information is available. And if you're a new or younger staff uh, at a primacy agency, it's really to uh, help you understand that there's a lot of information available on how to get up speed on rules, um, specifically small system issues, um, any topic related to water you can think of. And uh, along the way, one will go through those resources and some of those best ofs 
and we'll also go through the players, if you will, uh, the TA providers, associations, and states that actually have the wherewithal and have developed materials. You know, every state isn't created equal, and that's one thing we've learned. Some states put a lot of money towards their um, primacy program, and some states uh, don't, and it's uh, just a fact. And so some states have a lot more um, outreach and education materials available for their systems or others than others do. And, uh, and that really comes out uh, in our site. And, it, and it's an issue of, you know, if I'm in Illinois, am I really gonna look through 50 other state privacy agencies' websites to try to find information? This, we do that for you, is uh, the bottom line. So this is the front page, it's just wateroperator.org, and we're gonna go right into how to use the site and some of the resources that are available. So if you click on resource library at the top, um, it brings you to a list. Um, you can also scroll over it and it'll show this list as a dropdown. Um, but if you go into the document search, that's the 15,000 documents I mentioned. Um, we, we've got this listed as a, it's a three tiered nested search. And so initially you clicked on, you click on select and it'll drop down with four different options. And those are category, type, state, or host. Now, most of the time when you're looking for information um, for a report or a program or a spreadsheet or whatever, you're gonna look under category because you're looking for it under a specific topic, whether it's a WIA or arsenic or certification or whatever it might be. Um, I'll talk about the categories next, there's 32 categories, but also under type, if you're really more interested in learning by video, there's videos, um, magazines, handbooks, this is the list. And we not only list um, stuff for the states, but we also list some things uh, that are from Canadian provinces or the Canadian government where it's useful to a US operator. And also we have resources that are specifically for tribes. And then under host, you can see every organization that's listed. These are 800 water uh, or wastewater organizations that include you know, WEF and AWA and Rural Water and RCAP, all their affiliates, any other state associations, state primacy agencies, um, other trainers, as well as in federal government agencies um, that provide uh, some of those services. And as far as the categories, there are 32. Some are just water specific, you know, lead and copper, water uh, treatment, uh, distribution systems, and then some are specifically for wastewater. Um, and, and part of that is because in a small system world that we work in, a lot of times it's the same person doing both, right? Um, it's a small team, maybe two people for a really small systems, only one who might be operating both their water and wastewater plant or their lagoon in those cases or uh, whatever. But there's a, uh, we've tried to break this up so that um, we have a certain number of documents in each space, so to speak, and then from there you can narrow it down. And then there's some that are really for all operators, you know, water security, uh, utility management, safety, certification, exam prep, all those sorts of things. And so um, you can search under any of these categories um, and we'll just go through some examples of that. So going back to um, the document search page, after you click select, um, this time I clicked arsenic and what it shows you is there's 179 documents related to arsenic. Um, for each one, uh, the blue uh, lettered title is a direct link to that document. Uh, the summary below is, is our summary of what that document is. And again, it's quickly uh, a quick way to go through a, a lot of these. You can read these assessments of what's in this document. Do you want to look at a slide presentation or do you want to look at a manual? Um, and then from there, um, below is the source page that it's on. And that is an artifact of us starting in 2008 when the um, website flavor of the day, if you will, was for a lot of groups to put all of their documents on one web page and just make them all available. So if you go to that document page, you could see you know, all 50 documents somebody might have and that sort of thing. It's not as handy today having the source there, but in some cases it's still very appropriate. And then who the host organization is. And again, we don't pull your information down and host it ourselves. We link back to your website. So the idea is we're trying to get operators and uh, industry professionals back to the source of uh, that document, that web page, uh, that Excel spreadsheet, whatever it might be. And so uh, that's a lot of documents to go through. And so a lot of times you're gonna try to narrow that down. Um, if I just scroll through, um, you know, and click on this, the 44th document after I clicked on next page a few times, it shows 10 at a time, um, was this arsenic treatment. And if I click on that, it brings up a pop-up and this is from Maine and it's uh, information about arsenic. 
and you know Maine is a state that has a lot of arsenic and it's uh, they've done a lot of work um, even through their environmental public health tracking uh, to map arsenic in the state and understand um, those issues and so they're a good source of information. Um, you can also use the keyword filter over on the uh, right side at the top there. I clicked, I typed small systems and so what the keyword filter does is it looks in the title and the summary and also on our back end in our database, which this is all based on a SQL database. Um, it uses, uh, we can put in our own keywords. And so small systems has to show up in one of those three places for it to be a hit and be included here. So it's doing a live uh, search through our database every time. And in this case, there are 10 records that mention small systems uh, in some way. Um, one of the things I show a lot of times, I'm gonna show you an example of today, here in Illinois, um, we're 96% groundwater systems, and we have a lot of iron in our water, but we also have a few places in Illinois where arsenic's pretty high. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, one of the best ways to remove arsenic is to co-precipitate it with iron. And so um, when you understand that that's a possibility, um, you might, um, in some cases in Illinois, we've been able to optimize iron removal uh, to quote, also optimize arsenic removal and avoid a small system from having, having to add new treatment. Um, we've also had a few cases where systems have actually added iron, even though they have high iron, because it will increase the amount of arsenic that's being removed. And um, it means they back flush more often, but it means they don't have to add any other treatment. So whenever you look at arsenic and then type in the keyword iron, it shows 38 records. And as I go through those, the sixth one here is just arsenic removal during iron removal, which is exactly the topic that I'm looking for. Um, and so I click on that and it brings up uh, this presentation by Darren Lytle, who's at um, Office of Research and Development in Cincinnati, uh, you know, foremost arsenic expert uh, in the country. And um, this is a talk he gave in 2004, our webcast. And if you go through this, um, you can see, um, I just took a few of these slides and uh, because it's a case study in Michigan. And so it's a real case, this is what they really did and here's what they really found. And so they took this um, uh, plant where they're trying to remove arsenic and, and iron as well as manganese. And um, when the plant was using chlorine at the end of the treatment train, they were, they were getting 50% uh, arsenic removal. So they just tried it in different places to see what would happen. When they moved it before the pressure filters, they still got 50% removal. But when they added the chlorine back at the wells, so that it's coming into the plant um, and has that extra time and it's going through the aeration tower and all of those things, now they're achieving 75% arsenic removal. You know, um, if someone sees us who has those issues, uh, it may be a very simple change in their, uh, the way they do their treatment in order to, um, uh, to, to meet that standard uh, if, they're having, if they're close. And we have a lot of systems in Illinois that are, you know, that are flirting with the 10 PPB um, regularly, just because of the arsenic we have in some parts of our state. Um, the other thing that's really popular are videos. So another way to search at the top, it says type. That's one of the four things you can do when you click on type, it brings up uh, that list. Uh, it's websites, slides, presentations, reports, handbooks, uh, and videos. Um, there are new videos every week. It's becoming the much more popular um, way to look at information. In fact, um, we also run the private well class. And one of the comments we get regularly is that people would rather take our class as a video than as the PDF uh, class lessons that we send them. Um, you know, I'm an older guy. I don't get that. Um, I'm not a YouTube uh, surfer, if you will, um, but it is certainly the way things are headed. And so we try to find every video that's out there and we list those under our document search. Again, 660 is a lot to look at. So um, you can nest this by um, whatever you're looking for, if you know what topic you're looking for. So you can look at category, and if I say water treatment, it narrows it down to 95. That's still a lot of, um, of, docu of videos to look through, or even to just to read the summary. Um, if, you know, for instance, you've been told that a certain TA provider or a certain state has videos, you can then collect search by host. I know RCAP has some water treatment videos that are short videos. Uh, meant to help small systems. So if I add uh, the third nest there and say a rural community assistance partnership, now there are seven records related to water treatment. So uh, the first one here, conduct a periodic inspection. If I click on that, it brings up a Vimeo uh, five minute video on 
how to inspect your storage tank. So there's a lot of power in this, and um, you know it's really based on the five staff that we have here who are searching the web uh, constantly and adding information, and it really allows us to provide um, a lot of things that are out there. And I will say, and I'll probably say this more than once, um, we realize that there's things we're probably missing. And so, especially today, assuming that um, many of you are primacy agency staff, if there's things you have on your website and they're not in our files or in our database, um, just let us know and we'll get them added um, because that's important that we, um, as thorough as we can be. And, you know, sometimes bandwidth gets in the way uh, for uh, our ability to, to keep up with everything, uh, documents and events. So another way to search is a particular topic that's not a category like RTCR, and uh, I'll use that as an example a lot today. But um, there are 14 videos on RTCR, and it's interesting because um, I want to say about two years ago, if I would have searched, or maybe not quite that long ago, um, at one point there were only three videos on RTCR, and they were all from Iowa. Um, Iowa DNR put out these really uh, great videos on uh, the RTCR rule, and uh, so knowing that though, you can always go in and then type in Iowa uh, as a host and it'll show those three uh, videos that are really useful to, uh, yeah. Uh, click on that and it brings up the video, in this case on YouTube. So, um, so there's a lot of ways to find things. Um, this is actually a, a screen or a, a slide that was from the March 220 RTCR webinar that Hideyuki uh, delivered, and it's on our web page. Uh, the video is, and I was just going to, uh, in lack of a better term, reverse engineer how he came up with those resources. So even you know, at the beginning of the talk, he talked about basically what is coliform and where you can find that information. And you know, if you see this slide today, um, you can uh, either try to type in that uh, URL, um, or you can go to our website and just search for total coliforms a category fact sheets and case studies, Washington State Department of Health, RTCR. And so then it's that first one that's listed there. You could leave off the Washington State Department of Health and you'd find all the fact sheets and case studies under RTCR that we have in our uh, database. And so it'd be a longer list. Um, so there's just a lot of ways to search this. Um, the same thing with the sample siting plan. You can just say total coliform and sample siting plan and there's 38 records from a number of state and federal uh, sites. Uh, re regional sites as well, uh, regional uh, EPA sites as well as some of the states on the resources they've developed. And um, and I'll say this more than once too, but on ASWA's webpage under their RTCR tab, there's also a place for the states to share their information and look at each other's resources. It's only for the states. And I think I show a slide of that here in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, uh, level two assessment training, this is a manual. So you can search for guide or you can search under manuals. And I just, that's what I did. Um, there are 23 records. So in addition to the one from Pennsylvania, which is in this list, um, there's other resources from other states. And so if your state doesn't have a manual or doesn't have those resources, there's other places you can look. And you know, again, that's the idea behind our site really is that some states have materials on some topics and not others. Or some don't have any, some have a lot. Um, but this gives you all those resources. And an example I'm not going to show today is um, West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services, I believe it's uh, their agency, has two really great books on math problems that are for water uh, operators. For all four classes of operations they have in that state. And a lot of times we refer people to back to West Virginia site because those problems are pretty universal. You know, when you add chlorine, how you're mixing your dose is a, is a math problem, not a state uh, mandated one. So um, that's the advantage of going through uh, wateroperator.org to find uh, those sorts of things. Um, guidance manual, uh, same thing. You know, you can uh, search, I searched for small systems this time and it uh, gave us uh, th yeah, these two uh, documents. So it's a great way to find resources pretty quickly. Um, it's a lot better way to search the web than um, say using Google uh, or something like that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, ASDWA has an RTCR page and on there there's a button for RTCR for states. You have to log in. Um, 
So they have, a, it's a place for the states to share their forms, policies, procedures, and other things. Um, I will say that, um, you know, ASDA is made up of all the state drinking water administrators, but any state staff can contact ASDA and get a login. Um, you know, I don't have a login because I'm not state staff, but uh, anybody else, uh, anyone who is, uh, if you're at a primacy agency, you can get access to all this information that's uh, internal uh, for the states. And the best way to do that would be to click on the contact us button at the top of their page. And uh, there's an info at aso.org uh, email link. Okay. Um, I wanna talk about our event calendar, especially now with COVID, um, you know, that we've seen a huge change in the way uh, technical assistance and training are taking place. Um, if you click on event calendar at the top, one of the top menu items, it brings you to this page, which lists our webinars here, which, you know, we're on the next to last one of our, um, that we're doing this year. And, um, but if you scroll down the page, it, it's a calendar and it's set up the same way with a nested search. So um, the difference between documents and events is most of the time when you're looking for a document, you're gonna looking for a topic. Um, most of the time when you're looking for events, especially operators, they're looking for CEUs in their state. And so uh, the state button becomes a lot more important here. And typically what operators do um, before COVID or even during um, is you pick a state that you live in and then it shows you all the training that's going on in that state. So um, the way our calendar, it's cut, we custom made this calendar and the way it's set up is if there's three or more events on the same day, it only shows the acronym for the uh, trainer um, because otherwise this would get too cumbersome and so that's why you know the second only has TPC listed three times where the fourth has the Ohio EPA and OTCO um, webinars in Ohio. Um, what our database has in it is um, if it's an in-person training then it lists the state uh, that the training's in and it also lists the CEU states which are any states that accept that particular training for CEUs. And that comes into play because uh, some states cooperate a lot more than others. And in some areas, like in the Northeast, you know, a group like the Northeast, uh, uh, the New England Waterworks Association, many of their trainings are accepted in all seven New England states. So whether the training's in Connecticut or Rhode Island, an operator can go to that state and get training and it's accepted if they're, they live in, if they're operator in Massachusetts, for instance. And so, um, those trainings, if I clicked on, if I had Rhode Island up here, even if it was in Massachusetts, it might show up because it's telling operators that they can get Rhode Island CEUs there. And so this is the way it's typically used and the way our calendar works, you click on the event and it brings up all the information we've stored in our database about that event. And this all comes from these organizations' web pages, um, and except in a few cases where folks have contacted us, it's a small operator group and they don't have a web page they send us the information and we add it and put it in uh, our, for them. And so when you click on this, that Great Lakes training that was highlighted, it shows you the start date that it's, this is live online, uh, one, 10 o'clock central time, um, a link back to uh, the event, or in some cases it's, you know, it's maybe a go to webinar link, how much it costs with it's worth contact hours. And this particular one is a wastewater uh, or other. Uh, and that's the way the state of Ohio has things. Um, who to contact, you know, all the details, who the sponsor is, and uh, if it was more than one state that it, credit was accepted in, it'd list all the states there. So it's, uh, these details are what the operator needs to see, and you can just keep clicking on our con on our calendar on different ones and see this right, you know, without having to go to, you know, I don't know how many organizations are here, there were probably at least uh, eight or 10 um, to their websites individually. And so it's meant to be a service and to make sure that operators understand that there's a lot of other training available to them out there. There's groups like Hawk or Blue Book that go to different states and train, and they've got CEUs that are accepted in those states. You may not ever understand that you know you're using Hawk equipment in your lab, um, and not realize that Hawk is going to be in your state and train, and you can get CEUs for it. And so you can find that information here. Um, I wanted to show this is from a talk we gave back in April, um, and so this is what our webinar page. So the other way to search instead of state is you can search for type. So today, probably the most used search on our website is searching for events uh, as webinar or online. Um, but before the pandemic, there were some groups who also did training. Um, and I'd say two of the most 
uh, the two organizations that have done online training the most in the last couple of years is probably RCAC and Illinois Section AWWA. Um, every month there's something on our webinars page and there has been for a long time from those two organizations. But you can see a lot more groups by April were getting involved. And um, we only list, um, you know, if you look there on the 9th, it says WWD Magazine. Um, if it's a trade magazine or a private trainer um, who's you know, making a profit and they're not a supporting an operator group in some way, we only list their training if it's worth CEUs to an operator. So some company that makes a product and is going to have a webinar on how to use their product, unless they've gone to the trouble of getting it uh, approved for CEUs in at least one state, we won't list it. And you know, just a couple months ago, I went round and round with a company that wanted us to list their webinars, and uh, I explained to them what we wanted. And to their credit, they went out and uh, worked with their state um, to get it accepted for credit. So now we list it um, because our, you know, our motivation and our goal is to support operators, uh, and that's uh, who we uh, that's the lens we put everything through. But um, I wanted to show this April one just to show you the difference today. And so, you know, there's a fair amount of webinars going on by April, but today, um, if I go on, um, this is November. So there's a training on Sunday, two trainings on uh, Sunday the 1st, and this isn't even the, the whole first week. Um, if I go back, this is three weeks worth, uh, two and a half weeks in April. But now today, we're not even through the first week and you can see how many trainings there are. So I just copied the whole calendar and I'm just gonna scroll through it. There were um, 51 events on Wednesday the 4th, as you can see by a lot of different organizations. And today's the 10th. And if you look at the bottom here, the fifth one says WU. That's that's wateroperator.org. I really don't like using that term outside of our internal stuff, but uh, it's on there. So, um, but that page just keeps going. Today's the, uh, there's more webinars today than any other day in the month. There's 53. Um, and you can just see, it's just amazing. Um, how uh, different organizations in different states, Missouri DNR is listed there. You know, US EPA obviously does a lot of training, but most folks have picked up that banner now and are trying to do things. Even though since September, we're starting to see some TA providers going back to in-person training. And, uh, you know, to their, uh, to their defense, there are some things that you can't train an operator about uh, online. There's some things that are hands-on. And so they went to a lot of special uh, effort to figure out how to um, to do those things. And I know um, a number of organizations now are back to doing at least some of their events uh, in person. But if I scroll through this, I highlighted these three at the bottom just because um, you know the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems started training on Sunday. And I, I haven't asked them why, that'd be interesting to find out, but they have something every Sunday uh, in this month. And the Texas Water Quality Association is actually having an event on Friday the 27th after Thanksgiving. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't, I don't, that could be a typo, but it just uh, shows you that you know there's so much out there now uh, that's online. And what we tell operators, just like we tell people for this webinar, is that you know contact them in advance. If you know if RCAC is holding an event that's on a topic you're really interested in, first contact your primacy agency and find out if they'd accept it. And what they need if they're going to? Do they need something advanced? Do they need a, you know, do they need the slide deck? Um, it may be possible to get credit, and so it's worth your effort um, if you're going to attend it anyway um, to see. And then uh, contact RCAC in this case, uh, in my example, and they will, um, they'll, I'm sure they're more than happy to, to provide you the slide deck that they're going to use and the information you'd need to provide. Uh, to show your primacy agency. Because I know, you know, we don't mean to be a, a trainer per se, and we do have a groundwater and wells class. Our job really is to support all the other trainers and make sure operators can get to them. Um, but we do see there's a quite a need there. And so, um, you know, if you can get training from another state because it's on the exact topic that fits your water system, that's a lot better than going and taking training uh, just to fulfill your CEUs that's on a topic that isn't necessarily as relevant to your particular system. Uh, and that's what we try to explain to operators. So the way to get around that long list, you know, there's probably almost, there, I think there's about 500 events in November that are webinars, um, is just to nest your search. So if you're looking for something on water security emergency response, you can see there's a lot going on right now with uh, OEA. Uh, through the regions, um, US EPA regions, but there's also other events here. You can see the 
Uh, on the 12th CWEA uh, is the Central States Water Environment Association. And again, our site is for both water and wastewater operators, so you're gonna see both things. Um, but there's a lot of other groups that are training too. Or if you're interested in OEA, um, you can search that way. You know, look, I want webinars that are related to OEA, and here you see everything that's listed for November. And one thing I forgot to take a screenshot of is if you clicked on um, right below the AWEA where it says clear filters or view list, if you click on view list, it provides a drop down list of all of these events plus all the ones happening in the future months. So if you want to see what's going on in December or January, if these organizations already had it on their website, we've already added it. Um, there'll be a list that goes into December and further. Um, you know, many organizations put out their calendar for uh, six months or a year. And so there probably wouldn't be a lot after December 31st, um, but there's probably some December events that would be on that. Or you can just click on next and look at December as well. Um, and again, going back to, you can see what's uh, in Illinois and you know, ERTC on the second um, is our um, operator school that's down at uh, SIU uh, Edwardsville. And it's a nine month program uh, where they have up to 30 students a year that they train to be water and wastewater operators. And so that's a pretty, uh, well, it's a pretty, um, it's an interesting program. It's, it's unique in the country because they have, a, they have a, a plant that they can do water and wastewater um, training on. And they bring in wastewater from SIU Edwardsville uh, from their college and they use that and, and they can run four or five different treatment trains. They do confined space training and it's a nine month program to prepare people to be operators in Illinois and Missouri is pretty cool. Um, but you can see the other events going on in Illinois. And uh, again, you just click on that and it brings up the details. And so um, if you're a primacy person and you're interested in learning more about a particular topic, you know, there's a lot of things you can just sit in on. Um, and a lot of these are free, not all of them. Um, but, you know, especially the small system uh, focused programs, a lot of those are are funded through grants and uh, and available for you to watch. Um, I went back to uh, the full calendar and um, I was just gonna point out, you know, here's an RCAC rate setting pro, uh, class for small systems. It's today, it's on the 10th, um, but it's not till 2 p.m. Pacific time, which is 4 p.m. Central. So, you know, we get done between uh, 2.30 and 3 Central time, probably before that actually. And um, you, know, you could still see another webinar today if you're interested. So there's, there's a lot to look at. There's a lot of stuff available and it's a, a matter of spending a little time going through that. Um, so in addition to our documents and our calendar, which are by far the most popular parts of our website, um, we also have a blog. And what we try to do with our blog posts is write articles that are really relevant, um, that really provide uh, information that uh, operators can use and um, they're very detailed in that um, when needed even provide direction. And so um, I'm just gonna highlight a couple. Um, so one thing we noticed I mentioned earlier, back in September, we started seeing more TA providers going back to in-person training. Um, some of those had uh, guidelines with their training. If you're gonna come to our training, here's the guidelines you gotta follow. And when you start looking at those from different providers in different states, they're all over the map. Some have very few rules, some have very uh, sophisticated rules if you're gonna go take a class with them. You know, some are limited to 10, some aren't. And so um, our staff, we um, all look through our organizations that we're in, in charge of, so to speak, and we pull together all of those resources and all the differences between how states or how these TA providers are dealing with having in-person uh, training during uh, the pandemic. And Joe Wallachek, who um, manages our newsletter, put all that information together and uh, wrote this blog post. If you scroll down this page, um, you'll get to, um, you know, it's, it's got a before, during, and after class, things that uh, you should do. And really, we wanted to share this um, with our, our entire audience. And, you know, we do have a newsletter and it goes out to a lot of folks besides operators. Most states subscribe. Um, a lot of the EPA folks subscribe. And so we want to make this available so that, you know, if I'm an operator and I'm concerned, um, what I see in rural areas, I grew up in a rural area, you know, we just talked to a community in Illinois a few weeks ago that has had not had a single case of coronavirus in their town. It's a small town of about 400 people, but their view of, of 
what's going on versus in a larger community where we're seeing people get sick and die um, is very different. And they're not necessarily taking it all as seriously um, because they just haven't seen it. It's not the world they're living in. And so, um, but if I'm concerned that I'm gonna go to a training, you know, I might share this with my TA provider and just say, hey, I expect you to do this if I'm coming to the training because I'm gonna be safe, uh, that sort of thing. Same thing, um, RCAP and AWA with their EPA grant developed this um, OEA training and it's on AWWA's website. Now, um, it's available to anyone and you don't have to be an AWA member, but you do have to register. And actually, you know, the path to get through this in order to um, get to the training is a little bit cumbersome, especially with small systems. Some of those guys are very untrusting of the government or don't want to share their personal information. So they don't want to provide you an email address or anything. So we broke that down and this blog post actually walks through everything you need to do to get to the training uh, and with diagrams so that it's clear and they can follow it step by step and actually get to this information because it's really useful. Um, but if uh, you get stuck trying to log in or create a new account and never get to it, you're gonna give up. You're not gonna contact AWA in all likelihood or some of those folks won't. And so we've really tried to um, make this a clear uh, path uh, to get to that uh, particular uh, training. And then, you know, uh, the world today, we've had uh, certainly uh, with the justice movement from this summer and the things that happen, um, a lot of organizations have come out in defense of racial justice. And so what we did is put together a blog post that has a lot of resources that utilities uh, can use uh, to look introspectively and uh, policies that they can consider uh, to make sure that um, they're doing their part basically. And so um, that's the kind of blog post we try to write. You can see over on the side here, we've written a lot of posts over the years that, you know, the, the wateroperator.org program started in 2009 and we've been very fortunate uh, working with EPA at first and uh, directly and then with RCAP um, to be able to provide the service uh, to operators in the US. Um, the best way to get that information is to get our newsletter. It comes out every two weeks. Um, if you click on the newsletter tab at the top on the right, um, it brings you to this page. Just ask for your email address and we have three newsletters. Um, our main newsletter, if you will, is wateroperator.org. It comes out twice a month. Um, really every two weeks. And then we also have a technology news, which is a, um, about current uh, research or innovation or you know, drinking water technology or wastewater technologies that have been released or available. Um, sometimes it references, well, it does usually reference uh, journal articles and papers, as well as um, you know, things that are actually out in the marketplace. And, um, and that started when we were part of the de-risk uh, and the WIND Center. We were actually part of the WIND Center uh, the two uh, small systems technology centers that EPA stood up about five years ago. Uh, one's at uh, UMass, which is the team that we deal with, and then the other was at Colorado, uh, uh, Boulder. And then we also put out a tribal utility news once a month, and that newsletter is really specifically for tribal related issues. Certainly a lot of things that are relevant for any other water operator are also relevant for tribal operators, but we also try to provide uh, additional resources, things on other topics that are related, but not directly, uh, like on GIS or grant writing, um, expand that a little bit to provide some of those resources uh, to help uh, our tribal utility members uh, around the country. And I say members, we don't have any members actually. But if you scroll down this page, you can see all the past issues, and that's what I would ask of you. Take a look at a few of these, see if they make sense to you, if there's no fluff, it's all useful information. And um, you know, a lot of folks that get our newsletter have really um, have given us a lot of great feedback on um, how timely the information is and how uh, the breadth of information we provide. Um, it's really meant to be supportive of uh, everyone in the water industry. And so when you scroll down, you'll see, you know, we started our newsletter, I think in 2010. Um, and I just highlighted too, this is the one, this is from August 4th. And uh, this is the lead article on uh, the, what's going on with lead and copper. And then uh, resilient strategies, we usually put a resource in there. And this talks about the treatability database, which uh, you know is a great way to look at how different treatment options work and what they take out and all those things if you're not familiar with it. Um, and then we also put our blog posts on here. You know, the two of the three I highlighted were recent and they're listed there. 
Uh, we also feature a podcast and a uh, video every week, every two weeks. And so they're all things that are useful. And uh, yeah, and sometimes they're on wastewater, sometimes they're on water, we, we do both. So, uh, and then um, I did wanna mention back in March, we worked with RCAP to stand up a COVID resources page. And it was really taking the small systems perspective. Um, it's streamlined, so it's, you know, it's not uh, 15 pages long, but it's got some really good resources in it, um, including one that uh, Great Lakes RCAP put together probably 10 years ago on um, how to develop a plan for a pandemic, um, and it, which was really awesome. And so um, that is also, uh, when you go to our front page, you'll see a little button near the top that says something about our COVID resources. So some uh, other resources to take note of, and as primacy agencies, you know, two that hopefully you're pretty aware of, but uh, maybe not so much uh, some of the new stuff, um, our ASDA and EPA, I'm gonna highlight those. Um, and I do wanna mention again, um, all the information I'm providing today should be available on our website if you search, uh, using our search criteria. And um, we're also asking for your help. We you know it's a constant struggle to keep up because there's so much information flow these days uh, on the web and we vet everything. So we're not just throwing up anything anybody puts out. Um, we're reading the summaries, we're reading, you know, we're reading some of these documents and writing a summary of what's actually in it. And uh, that's a lot, it's time consuming, a lot of work. So um, if you're looking for resources, you know, if, if you're from a state agency, you can certainly go in in our search uh, bar and, the, and click on host and find yourself in there and click on it uh, under documents and it'll just show you everything we have listed for your agency. And if, um, if there's something missing or, you know, every once in a while, state agency will redo their web page and all the links break, um, someone's got to be the first one to let us know that those are all broken. And that's why there's a note at the top of our document search that says, you know, we really work to keep this updated. But once in a while, things happen. I remember a couple of years ago, South Carolina changed their website. And uh, I want to say it was about 146 documents we had to re-enter. Uh, uh, so those things are a struggle. But that's why our site's so useful, is the legwork we put into it. So if you do find any of those things or you have any questions, you can always email us at info at wateroperator.org. Um, so ASDWA, um, just in case some of you, I know um, the primacy agencies are certainly all aware of ASDWA, but some of you may not be if you're uh, with a, uh, a utility. ASDWA is the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. They represent the states. It's actually the State Drinking Water Administrator each in each state that's a member and they represent them in DC as well as um, provide policy information and help them share resources and work with the states to convene um, you know, work groups to look at best practices when things like PFAS or algal blooms or uh, some of those things happen. It's really ASWA that helps take the lead and as a go-between between the states and EPA in a lot of cases uh, to help um, bring everybody together and figure out you know, the best solutions for a lot of these things. So they've got uh, a number of reports, tools, and white papers on their website uh, that have been developed over the, um, a lot of those in the last two or three years, as well as program areas, you know, for the CCR, groundwater rule, RTCR, uh, small systems, all those things, and then also special topics as they come up, like Legionella, um, PFAS, and COVID-19. And so um, there's a wealth of information there, as well as a lot of the uh, events that get co-sponsored between ASDWA and EPA that are recorded, um, ASDWA has a lot of those recordings available through their website. And so um, I'm just going to walk through a few of their pages. Um, this is the White Papers and Toolkits page. It's under Resources. And I should have um, provided more here. There are a number of great uh, papers and um, reports or summaries or information from different uh, states uh, combined together, like on lead service lines and Legionella, um, you know, uh, where they formed a work group to look at best practices. Um, this page goes down, uh, there's probably 15 or 20 different reports and documents here, and it's worth just going to that page and taking a look. And um, yeah, it, there just wasn't time today to highlight everything, I guess. And so, uh, and they have a COVID page. What's cool about this page, um, they do have an FAQ that you can download, but also they have uh, state resource pages below if you scroll down. And you know what we see um, from stepping back and looking at all the states is that we, I think we have about half or maybe a little less of the states where their primacy agency is also their health department, like Minnesota and New York. Um, but then we also have states like Illinois where our state uh, primacy agency is our Illinois EPA, 
And we also have an Illinois Department of Public Health that's really uh, leading the COVID uh, effort. And so this links to both of those uh, sets of resources. So you can get to the COVID page that each state set up, whether it's the actual drinking water primacy agency or not. And so there's a lot of good information down there and uh, on those pages. And I think there's a clickable map as well. Um, you know, PFAS, uh, this is the best place probably to find information on what's going on and keeping up to date. You know, EPA is still working on methods. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, as different states decide to uh, regulate PFAS on their own. Uh, we're seeing a lot of differences in how states are choosing to do that. And so um, this is probably, uh, well, this is uh, a good place to see uh, the most up-to-date information. And, you know, it's updated as of October. And so, you know, uh, PFAS uh, substances uh, are a moving target and they're probably going to be for a few years. And it's just uh, the more time we have, the more we're learning. And obviously, if you go, go down this page, there's a lot more information. And you can see at the bottom there, it says their comment letters and letters and testimony they provided on this topic are all available uh, for folks to, to take a look at. Um, and then I already showed this, I believe, but I wanted to highlight it about the states only section here um, on RTCR. So you can, um, it's got links to different pages, including EPAs as well as um, a login for the states to use for their resources. And so um, again, um, you can reach out to ASDWA if you don't have a login and you are part of a primacy agency, um, you can get access. So, and then um, this is probably one of the coolest things I mentioned earlier, they have a lot of webinar recordings. So they just did the pandemic's uh, impacts uh, meeting um, on October 26th. Uh, it looks like these were all on from the 26th. Oh, this is from ASDA's uh, annual conference, actually. I'm sorry, I saw pandemic impacts. And so, um, and this was a day that was open to everybody, I believe. Um, and then the other days were just for the states to work on uh, the issues along with EPA. But if you go down this page, it also is a very long list. And, and every one of these webinars is available to you. And so it's a matter of what topics you're interested in. And, uh, you know, um, you can find a, a lot of resources there. So then, you know, US EPA's website, if you go to our uh, document search and just put in host equals uh, US EPA, it's somewhere near 1600 documents. And, um, you know, we've been working with the EPA's webpage for over 10 years. And, you know, they've changed their website and it's actually in a constant uh, state of flux uh, as some pieces get updated. It's just such a large uh, website. And so we actually link the documents that maybe are a dead end now and you can't get to from EPA's webpage. And that's just an artifact of, um, you know, it's really tough to make sure that all those links redirect where they're all supposed to and that you don't leave anything hanging. And, uh, you know, we find even on our website uh, for the water survey, we find once in a while someone will have a link to a page that, you know, we thought was gone, but the actual link is still there. If it searches on Google and actually finds that particular link, um, you know, in our case, it was a, an old version of a, a well log form that drillers are supposed to use, and uh, it was well outdated, and we just didn't realize it was still there. So these are some of the resources that um, either are newer things that they've developed or things that are really um, you know, important to understand uh, what they are, and if you're not familiar with them, um, just to make you aware. And so... Um, the drinking water workshop, I don't know if I had you in a room, I'd say how many people have been to at least one. I know I've been to about 14 of the 17 um, or 13 of them. It's the best workshop I attend every year. So this started out as the arsenic demonstration program and uh, through ORD, and it's grown into the small systems workshop that's done jointly by um, Office of Research and Development, Office of Water, uh, at both at EPA and ASWA. And uh, it's an amazing agenda. They usually bring in national experts and along with the experts at ORD um, to talk about drinking water issues, small system issues. And a lot of those are you know, things about um, manganese, for instance, that are coming up now and uh, Legionella and buildings and you name it. So on their webpage, you can get to this link for the workshop that was just held in August. And all of those recordings are on this page. But there's also links to some of the older ones. Um, I just went back to my um, one of my directories where I had emails from the one from last year, and their contractor Cadmus 
had put all the talks up from last year's conference, the 16th one. And so I just went to that page. It's still active. You can get to all the presentations. But these presentations are all about relevant issues uh, for you, especially if you're uh, in a privacy agency. And a lot of these talks are by state folks or consultants who have worked on these in particular uh, specific instances on things that, uh, you know, it's, it's cutting edge. And so um, it's really worth uh, you to understand that those resources exist, as well as understand that um, next year and following years, um, this is one, if there's a way for you to go, they make it free. And I believe, you know, I'm, I'm not part of any uh, state agency, but I believe they pay for one or two state staff to come every year and pay their travel, but everybody else is on their own. And this started out as less than 100 people uh, 17 years ago in the last couple of years uh, when it was in person, it was over 400, and I believe this year, um, and Azra can correct me, um, but I believe there were over a thousand attendees because it was virtual, uh, which is awesome, and that's what you want to see because it's uh, you know, a lot to learn, a lot to be learned. Um, this ECHO program, the Enforcement and Compliance History Online, especially if you're someone pretty new to your privacy agency, it's a cool way to see where your state has been. Um, and uh, as you go down this page, there's a, a bunch of charts and it says here, view basic criteria. Um, I clicked on advanced and uh, so it shows you this dashboard and I just typed in Iowa just um, because it looks like Iowa's doing a pretty good job. And I, so I thought that'd be a good one to highlight, um, but you can go in and change the water source to groundwater or surface water. You can say PWS type, whether it's non-community or community. Um, and then you can see how your state has been doing since FY11. And uh, you can see here um, all the things it shows, and, I'm, and I didn't have a chance to really play with this as much, but you can also search by tribe or just by region, and you can see a regional perspective um, on how you're doing. Um, but it's a pretty neat tool, and it uh, gives you an idea, kind of a scorecard, if you will, on how the, your state's doing. And, um, you know, some, certainly the, that bar at the end, um, I saw a few states where the FY20 year to date uh, was not the lowest, but the highest uh, on some of these charts. And so, uh, you know, there's states that have, um, you know, be, based on their governor's orders or whatever, have had uh, different issues in following through with their responsibilities uh, this year. Um, this monthly webinar series, this is um, Michelle Latham from ORD, basically coordinates all this, and um, they do a webinar every month, and it kind of is tied to the to the workshop every year, but they bring in different experts every month on different topics. And the one on the 17th, which is next Tuesday, is on AWEA, and they're having two different presentations. Um, I did want to point out, I highlighted wateroperator.org. EPA is very generous to us. They really feel like our site is useful to the folks they represent, and so they provided our link on their web page. But if you scroll down this page, um, you can get to all the past webinars. They've all been recorded. And like on ASLA's page, where there's a lot of really useful webinars on topics that are really relevant to you as a primacy agency, the same way here, you know, like the very bottom one here, June 25th, 2019, um, sanitary survey. So it's not only an EPA person from the Office of Water, but it's also someone from one of the state agencies and how they've implemented some um, part of their sanitary survey program. And typically what EPA does is they bring in someone who's doing something that's really good or that's innovative and it's something that they want other states to consider um, because it's actually you know, a better way to deal with that part of their program. So you can watch all of these, you know, the Legionella one that was in January. Um, and so there's just a lot of really useful webinars here where they brought in someone whose uh, responsibility is that topic at EPA, as well as a lot of times a consultant or a state agency where they've uh, found a, uh, you know, a unique or innovative way to implement that part of their uh, primacy program. So um, it's certainly worth taking a look. And then um, in the last couple of years, they developed this uh, drinking water training program, which you create a password and a login, and then it basically walks you through all the drinking water regulations. So especially for someone who's new, or, you know, this is, certainly isn't just for primacy people, it's really for operators and uh, systems and, and everyone else as well. It's a great way to learn the rules, and uh, I encourage you all to take a look at that and, and try it out. And there's a number of modules inside there for all the different things that are going on, and you can even track it. Um, and I, we'd have to talk to EPA about whether any of that's available for any kind of credit, 
Um, I know from our own experience, you know, we have one class that's online, it's called Groundwater and Wells, and uh, poor Jill has worked on trying to get uh, CEUs for that uh, nationwide for almost two years, and I think we're up to about 30 states who have approved it for at least a couple hours of CEUs. It's, it's just a, it's really a, a um, a nightmare to try to get that training approved and you know in some cases I get it because a lot of times the trainers are making money off of uh, the training they do or that's how they're sustaining their business but in our case we're offering it for free and so it's a lot of resources we've sunk in to trying to get that approved to help operators um, when there's you know there's certainly no uh, payback in the form of uh, helping to uh, sustain our program but uh, again this is a, a pretty useful uh, tool. And then um, they also have a page that says straight resources for implementing drinking water rules. Assuming most of the uh, privacy agencies are aware of this, but I wanted to point it out because it's the kind of the one place where um, you know the state should start if uh, you're you're nosing around the EPA's webpage for information. Um, some other notable things I wanted to highlight uh, just quickly. Um, you know, Utah has a study help program. We were actually made aware of this just a few weeks ago. Um, we didn't have it on our website. We do now. Um, it's actually a complete program to help an operator prepare for a uh, certification exam. And even though Utah DEQ developed it, we've, um, we learned from another state a TA provider that they're using it verbatim to train, to train their operators uh, and prepare them to take uh, their certification exam in their state uh, across the country. So, um, and Minnesota has this operations manual. I want to talk about that for a second. And then, um, you know, Maine has a really nice uh, improvement. It's approval and review procedure and policy related to their drinking water treatment rules. And then this uh, kind of um, into the weeds is the Minnesota Department of Health Water Guidance and Additivity Calculator. But it's if if you're into those things and it's an issue. You know, we have uh, the Chicago area in Illinois, so we certainly have a lot of groundwater that gets contaminated. And so a tool like that certainly um, in some cases can have a role. And it's not something that you would normally uh, be looking for. And so I want to highlight that. So here's the study help page. Um, it's a complete set of lessons on um, all the things you need to be ready to take the certification exam. Um, if you follow, go down the page, there's videos, there's class lessons. Um, it's really a comprehensive uh, uh, set of uh, training, more so than uh, it, it, you know, it's really well done. And uh, that's the, um, all I'll say about that, but you can find that on Utah Department of Environmental Quality. Um, this is Minnesota Rural Water Association's webpage, but the Minnesota Water Works Operations Manual is a joint effort between um, US EPA, uh, Minnesota Rural Water, and I think they have a training coalition there too, and Minnesota Department of Health. So this has got 27 chapters, and it, it's a really good um, example for other states maybe to copy or use for how to provide uh, this sort of information if you don't already have it. Illinois has one too. It's called um, the Water Samplers Handbook. It's a you know it, I think it's it's only 18 chapters, but it's kind of similar, and it's on the IEPA webpage. Um, but if you go into this document. You can see that it's on its fifth publication. It was just updated in spring of 2020, which is awesome because before that had been 2009. So it's up to date. Um, you know, Minnesota Department of Health is one of the um, more savvy, if you will, health departments in the country or primacy agencies. They've um, put a lot of resources into things like, um, you know, doing research on viruses and, uh, you know, they're ahead of the game a lot of times and uh, provide a lot of great resources and they're well staffed and. Uh, they're one of the have, uh, haves, not one of the have-nots, if you will. So um, this is a really well-done publication, and uh, you can get to that, uh, well, from our website or from uh, Minnesota Rural Water Association. And um, I mentioned the main um, drinking water treatment review and uh, approval policy procedure. 65-page document, I think, um, if I'm not getting confused, on um, how to review and approve and what policies you need to consider uh, and it is for Maine, so it's based on their rules and laws, but um, you know, it would really be beneficial for anyone uh, who's involved in that part of their program, just as a reference, uh, if uh, depending on what's available uh, that you have on your own. Sometimes you're just looking at legislation and uh, you know, that's uh, not necessarily worded in a way that uh, makes it easy to comprehend and follow. Um, at least that's my take on legislation. 
So, and then I mentioned this uh, water guidance and additivity calculator. So this thing's really meant to take every possible contaminant and uh, it evaluates its carcinogy, uh, how, how, how carcinogenic it is, and also uh, what kind of health risk it has. And um, you can apply, uh, it, it's an additive index. So even if you have you know, four chemicals that are all below the, an MCL or a health limit, um, it'll give you some idea if any of those add based on their characteristics or what their health endpoint is. And so it's certainly useful to a utility that maybe um, have some uh, very low levels of certain things in their water um, just to consider uh, and take a look at whether they, um, if it's really causing a health risk or not. And so when you go to that, it's an Excel spreadsheet. You know, the tab at the bottom on introduction explains how you do this and what the rationale is. And I'll leave that for you all who are interested. But then if you go to the data entry page, it, you just basically add in um, the values you've got from a groundwater sample. And then it's gonna give you um, how it adds it up and um, what kind of guidance it should provide. So um, it's pretty neat. And uh, I thought I'd end with that just because um, it's, it's, not, it's kind of off the beaten path, if you will, for some of the main compliance issues we all deal with. And uh, yeah. And so with that, we did get a few questions, um, not very many, but I'm gonna go through those uh, quickly. And so, um, you know, everyone who registered had an opportunity to register or to, um, to in advance uh, ask a question, and we only got four. And so um, the first one was, what's the best way to get information about virtual trainings out to water systems? Well, so um, put it on your website clearly, and, and, if, um, and ask your trainers and technical assistance providers to share it with their classes and their clients they all have newsletters. They all send information out um, about their trainings. And so even ask them to put it in their trainings uh, so that it's made available. And uh, you know, a lot of you are funding those uh, TA providers to do those trainings in the first place. And so use them. I mean, that's what they're there for. And uh, they're more than happy to do that. You know, make sure it's on our calendar. Um, if it's, you know, you're doing a virtual event that you've, you're, you're not normally a trainer, if you will, then we may not even know that uh, your website has training on it. Uh, if we haven't visited recently, you know, we find trainers and we add them into a list, um, but if someone's doing it for the first time, uh, we may not know. So drop us an email. And then, um, you know, you should have your own listserv or newsletter or email list. If you don't already, a number of states do. I actually subscribe to a lot of them um, because it's really useful stuff usually from about that state or um, some of the things they've done or when they've changed their rules. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool information. And the last thing, make sure you provide all the details. Kind of, um, I'm making a, a pitch for the, the way we provide event information because the water system can look at that and see exactly what they're gonna get. And so um, these are a few that I subscribe to, um, you know, ADQ to Arizona. Uh, this actually came out this morning, so I added it, um, that they've improved their database. You know, I don't have access to their database, but, um, uh, operators there do. Uh, they put out lists of operators who are out of compliance or whose certification is going to um, end. Um, and then Iowa DNR, they have a really great newsletter where they actually, it's, it's more like a newsletter. They talk about where their certification opportunities, um, when their videos came out, they put that stuff out there. Sometimes they even highlight some of the stuff from our newsletter, which is, you know, we appreciate um, because we um, they have a better uh, audience in Iowa than we do, clearly. Um, a couple others we subscribe to are Massachusetts DEP and uh, State of Ohio, their list. And, you know, every state does things different, too. So, like, Ohio is interesting um, because of the way they uh, enforce their compliance. They do things a little different way. They make it more expensive to not test than to test. Um, and so that's, a, you know, I think is a neat approach, in my own opinion. Um, and so, yeah, we try to follow what they do. And plus, because they're so close, uh, because the workshop, the small systems workshop in, is in Cincinnati, a number of their staff are there every year and, and they're usually speaking and they're on the forefront of things like, you know, um, algal bloom problem that was, uh, that happened in Lake Erie and uh, just a number of instances of things where um, Ohio EPA has really gotten involved. So a lot of their staff are typically there and we've gotten to know some of them. And uh, yeah, it's just that they're really doing good work. Um, and then I just threw up two of our uh, details from two of our events, uh, one's on the 19th and one's on the 17th. Just as a reminder, uh, no matter who the trainer is, um, having these details really gives the operator what they need um, to know 
whether or not they want to get involved or take your training or um, what's going on. And so, um, you know, some of them cost, and you know, Illinois section doesn't charge its members here. I think this is one of those. Uh, I don't remember. Oh no, there's no fee for that one. But some of them uh, charge, and uh, you know, as long as there were CEs, we'll list them because if they're worthwhile and they're worth CEs for operators, that's kind of our approach. Okay, so the next question we got was, um, do small drinking water systems have enough backup operators in Massachusetts in case of an emergency? When I first saw this, I wasn't gonna answer it because you know we're a national program and if every state, someone in every state started asking questions about their state, um, one, they're all different and it'd be really difficult for us to actually manage that. But um, I took this as an opportunity just to um, offer what I did to answer this question and what you as a state compliance agency um, should also consider if maybe you do this already but the way, best way to find this information is to contact your ta providers they know they know if a, of a if a community is going to have an operator problem if someone's getting ready to retire even you know not related to the pandemic um but uh you know just like i'm a member of the illinois uh, rural water association so uh, back in i want to say in june or so there was an email that came out to all the members saying hey is anyone willing to volunteer? We're starting a list. And NRWA, the National Association, asked all the state affiliates to do that. So I reached out to my rural water association and asked them about Massachusetts. And so he reached out to Massachusetts Rural Water, and he was, and this is the response they gave us was that D, uh, Massachusetts DEP has a list of available operators that they've maintained even before the pandemic. And it's mostly contract operators and those in the field who maybe aren't practicing, uh, they maintain their license, but they aren't at a plant right now. And so um, they can help out in a pinch. But, um, and then I also reached out to our cap solutions in Massachusetts. We work a lot with them and they really, um, yeah, they're really good folks. And so um, they said basically that, that Massachusetts Waterworks Association had started a list after the pandemic, but it was pretty thin list. And uh, so, but I also learned a lot more about what's going on in Massachusetts by contacting those folks. And that's, um, you know, Massachusetts uh, DEP has really ramped up their emergency certification and renewal program uh, in anticipation of these problems. And so they're working with operators who may, let, may have let their license expire um, or that um, aren't going to be able to get their CEUs to maintain their license because of the issues related to the pandemic so they can get a waiver to extend their current license uh, and things like that. And um, as far as the volunteer list, one of the real issues is liability. And when you think about it, that's, you know, when you think about the WARN program, W-A-R-N, that many states have, um, it's the same problem. It's, it's, you know, if you go in and work on somebody else's equipment and, it, and there's a problem, then who's liable? And so, um, you know, and, and what was mentioned to me from RCAP Solutions was that, you know, they have in Massachusetts that those MOUs in place for fire departments, but not for water and wastewater. And so, um, you know, that's something for you all to consider. And it's one of the reasons why I went ahead and brought this up. But um, in Massachusetts, they expect a shortage because a lot of older operators are kind of tired of the pandemic and the issues that's caused. And so some that maybe weren't gonna retire for a year or two are now considering retiring a lot sooner. And so uh, just through the grapevine, they've heard that um, they may be running into a problem there because of that. And we've seen here in Illinois, the same thing. Uh, some operators that have retired um, because you know we're getting into week or to month uh, eight of the pandemic, and it's uh, you know it's becoming um, if they can't retire, they're ready just to do something else. So, um, and the other thing we heard was that contract firms are at capacity, and so some are actually even in some parts of Massachusetts are turning down new accounts. So communities may go to them and ask them to run their facility, and uh, they're not uh, able to take them on. And uh, so we also heard that, you know, especially for small systems, a lot of times in the past, it's always someone from a neighboring town who helps out um, or an employee in the field who steps up to cover. And so far that hasn't been needed because of the pandemic. And, you know, that's, uh, I've come from rural America, small town, and you see the same type of uh, community that you see among farmers. So, um, the, you know, and I just tell the story because it was personal to me, uh, my uncle broke, uh, got hit by a, a kick by a, a, a horse and it broke his hip. And so it was right before our harvest and all the other farmers in our area came out and um, they all harvested his corn for him, um, 800 acres. 
and you know, that's what people do for each other in rural areas. And um, and so I can see where that's um, how, why a lot of small systems don't even join like the WARN program because they already have relationships with their neighbors. And I just wanted to point all that out. So um, another question we got was, is there a need for a building water system operator classification to train and license operators properly for buildings um, that apply treatment? So um, I wanted to show this white paper, and this is on the Legionella page on ASWA's website. So last year, ASWA uh, commissioned this ESPRI uh, to develop a white paper on this issue, not on whether you need it or not, but if, um, if an operator is going to manage a building system, um, what should it be? So even though I clipped this out, it's out of context. Recommendation for a new class of operator for um, building water systems. This white paper isn't recommending that states create a new license for building operators. What they're saying is if if a state chooses to do that, here's some things you need to consider. And um, you know because there are differences and there is training that would be relevant for a building system um, that you know are unique because of uh, the way you know, buildings are just set up. And uh, you know, there's just a lot of issues there. So I recommend if uh, the person that asked this question or anybody else interested, um, go to the Legionella page on ASWA's website and it's under special topics. And you can see the first thing here is uh, this building water system operators white paper from May 19. And uh, download that and read the whole thing. And you'll get the gist of what ASWA was saying, which isn't they believe everyone should have one, but it's just saying, you know, it's really up to the states and their job is to make um, recommendations on whatever you choose to do. Uh, here's some things you should consider. So, um, and I hope I haven't butchered that too much. And I know um, at the end here, uh, as well, it's going to be around to answer questions. So, um, if anything comes up there. So, with that, um, I do want to thank ASWA for co sponsoring and promoting our webinar today and being here for um, these additional questions. And I need to um, pull up our, um, if I can find it, our live webinar questions. It looks like we have two. So I need to um, get out of that real quick and pull this up and make it full screen. And uh, sorry, I'm going to enlarge this. Okay. Um, so we had two questions, it looks like, so far, and Katie's still monitoring if you have anything else. Um, how do you deal with the problem of broken links? Some organizations do not keep their websites current. Well, so that, you know, that is the problem. Um, it's really difficult. So I have, um, I guess I have six staff, some are part-time, um, who work on this all the time. And so, um, you know, we've had to decide as more organizations provide more training and more documents we're trying to streamline um, what we provide and we had some information in there that may have been six or eight or ten years old and so one thing we've stopped adding are forms in, for a website from a state so if you're a state an operator in a state and you need a certain form to do whatever um, you need to go to your state website to get it anyway um, and we've also then some of the older documents um, if there's newer things that we know are better and more appropriate um, we've eliminated those. Our entire staff each took a section of our document database and uh, we went through them all to check all the links for one um, and also um, to see how relevant they were. And we went from 18,000 documents down to 15, but there are better 15,000 documents. And so um, that's one issue is the broken links and we do try to go through those once a year. Um, and so we always find things that aren't current or people tell us you know, hey, I, this link was broken. Um, and we certainly ask people to do that, and that's why. Um, yeah, so I'm glad someone asked this other question uh, about the not secure. So I went round and round with RT folks. You know, we're inside the firewall at the University of Illinois, which is, um, you know, they had a um, security breach, I want to say, in September of 17. I'll never forget it because I used to give this webinar live. I'd actually use a live website and go through examples until that day because that particular day I was up at Region 5's office in Chicago giving a live webinar and the website went down. And so since then I use screenshots um, because it was embarrassing and there's no way around it. And so, um, but 
you know, that's a this this non-secure thing. It's not that our website's not secure. It's it's some certificate that we have to have that the particular server we're on doesn't have. We're still behind the U of I's firewall. Everything is secure, and I've complained and complained and complained. And um, we're moving to a new server um, in January, and at that point, that will not be there anymore. Um, but um, we're small fish, so to speak, compared to some of the things that are on a couple of these servers here. And so um, I won't get it done until then. Um, and yeah, so we will change it, but we can't just do it. Uh, it's a, it's just because of a security certificate that's outdated. And so that's the way it, it comes up. And so, um, no, it shows up for me. It shows up at home. It's, it's there for everybody. Um, but what I can tell you in 100% certainty is that our website is secure. Um, yeah, we have tons of protocols in place because of that uh, breach from 2017. And, uh, you know, we have to, we have all these rules we all have to follow. Um, we, you know, we can't get on anything anymore related to our work without uh, having it go to our phone and, and have us confirm. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's pretty intense. And so that's why that's showing up. Um, and I apologize. That's all I can say. So um, I do want to uh, mention that um, both uh, Kevin Letterly and uh, Deidre White from Arca or from ASDWA are here. And uh, do you want to say anything? Um, there's no questions that were directly related to ASDWA stuff, but I'm sure you can do a better job explaining what was on ASDWA's website than I can. Um, and I don't know if you can unmute yourself or oh, you're self muted. Yeah, so that's up to you guys. Hi, this is Deirdre. Can you hear me? Sure can. Yeah, no, thanks um, for all these great resources, Steve. And um, I'll just, you know, just reiterate um, what you said about ASPA's website as well, that, you know, we do have um, resources available uh, to the public as well as if states um, have logins for the website. And so there is a lot of additional information um, specific to states. Um, if you uh, do have a login and any state primacy staff can um, get a login just by requesting it from as or info at asdwa.org on the website. Um, so, you know, we also welcome any suggestions for improvement. And I think um, just everything that you've gone through today, Steve, has been very helpful. There's so much information, and I am sure it's very hard and takes a lot of time to compile it all into one location for, for your website, especially. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, um, if there are no other questions, um, we'll let everyone get back to their day. Um, if Again, if anything comes up, it's info at wateroperator.org for our email address. And I do apologize about the not secure. I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to and I forgot. Um, and it is, uh, there's no way for me to change it today, but um, it is a secure site. So um, thank you for attending and um, have a good day. All right, take care. And Deidre and Kevin, when I end this, there's no way not to cut everybody off that I've been able to figure out. So I'm gonna lose you, but thank you again. Um, and I appreciate all your help. Oh, no problem. Thank you. All right, take care. Thanks.